Aparecieron colectivos de abogados. Aparecieron bajo uno y otro nombre voceros del terrorismo. Siempre el colectivo de abogados se llega en caliente. Yo lo llamo como una sala de urgencias, ¿no? Donde de manera muy rápida tienes que responder a muchas cosas y, y te vas especializando lamentablemente en cosas que no se debería especializar nadie. Cuando alguien conoce todo de ti, tu vida, tu familia, tus comunicaciones, eh, se, se tiene la sensación de ser absolutamente vulnerable. ¿Por qué si lo que estamos haciendo es absolutamente legal? Si ayuda a construir un Estado social de derecho, tenemos que vivir con zozobra, con miedo. El gran tema es el tema del colectivo de abogados, cómo el colectivo de abogados está haciendo lo que está haciendo en la Corte Interamericana de Derechos Humanos, cómo el colectivo de abogados persigue las fuerzas militares implacablemente, cómo el colectivo de abogados... Y pues yo no dudo que la sociedad en su conjunto si quiera construir algo justo. O sea, a mí me parece que, que los que están interesados en que eso no sea así son muy pocos. Tener un trabajo digno y que todo funcione bien, yo creo que le interesa a todo el mundo. Vamos, um, eh, el libro y el, y el film está... Uh, Both book and film have been produced by Antonio Giron, who is a Spanish script writer, a sociologist as well, and who for several years is following up close everything happening to those who defend human rights in Colombia. Jose Avoa Estrepo is fully committed to the promotion of human rights and he is fully qualified, which, by the way, has meant that he's been threatened by paramilitary groups and he's been also exposed to other dangers. And even Worse, he was subject to institutional threats and harassed because of the harass of the DAS group, which was an intelligence service chasing different groups amongst them Mr. Westrepo, and they were under surveillance, uh, these groups, and what this actually caused them to ask for cautionary measures as for the problems of those who promote human rights in, in Latin America, that, that's what the, this is this film in and book are about. Hola a todos y a todas. Good morning, everyone. Gracias. Good evening, good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers of this conference for having invited us to be here and to somehow give you an idea of the current situation of the humanitarian crisis, the problem of armed conflict that is prevailing in, in Colombia. And it's been so for decades now. And unfortunately, it's not breaking news anymore. It doesn't seem to be a consistent narration. It is just some spots about what's going on there. And with this, what we wanted was to improve our understanding of a situation about which we only hear small fragments, small abstracts. And for almost a year and a half, where we held meetings in Colombia and elsewhere with other peoples who are favoring human rights and who were 
familiar with human rights situation in Colombia, we tried to charter, to map down the different approaches to conflict in Europe, not just from a legal point of view. Of course, when we work in the field of communication, that's what we want. We want to have this symbolic production and cultural production, and we want to enlarge a pool of knowledge. This kind of fora, like, like the one we are in, where we see legal actions and, and also law-based decisions, and we see how there are some interpretation conflicts there. But when we're talking about knowledge production, well, our task, those of us who work in cultural production, we need to make these people known. When I say these people, I mean those who lead the investigation. That's the main target. It is a documentary film, as we explained, which was previewed in Colombia, and then in Colombian TV, and then in other places in Latin America, and also in other festivals. But there we found an opportunity to chat, to talk to very interesting people that would help us understand from the Colombian point of view and also from a much more global perspective what what the source was, or how it had originated this Colombian conflict. And well, in the documentary film we saw a large amount of experiences, of stories that set the time in the timeline for these people, both as, as, as private people and as professional people, because that's what they wanted. Using the legal system, they want to make the rule of law work. Uh, I'm talking about human rights, uh, such as right to life or right to exist within differences, freedom of speech, which is clearly threatened in Colombia. I will not dwell on this. I just want to invite you because uh, on June the 17th, we will show the whole film and also the book in Traficantes de Sueños Bookshop here in Madrid, which is an association based space, very interesting here in Madrid. The invitation, you can see it on, on, on the webpage, traficantes.net. All this hard work, the book, the DVD, that's what it tends to be, an invitation for all of you to get to know this situation where we find brave people like uh, Guillermo Pérez, who is with us today, and who has been risking his life, as many other people, for decades now, because they understand that solidarity needs to prevail over those crimes that are being committed in Colombia. That those culprits, those perpetrators need to be held accountable. We take, talk about truth, justice and, and remedy. That's what we claim. And there are violent sectors of the society that are using them as a war target. And so those people need to be more visible, need to have our scored in them. So it's not just about knowledge. We want you to know what's going on there. But on top of that, it's a protection, a secure, safety and security strategy. Because we need to understand that world, something that that cannot be neglected, and that is human rights. Thank you very much, Antonio. This book is a chronicle. Little drops of water that make a stone crack, that make a, a rock crack. Being or defending sometimes is difficult, or promoting human rights is difficult because they are even called uh, terrorists. When they just want human rights to, to, to be abided we by. So we need to take into account the standards that are set by institutions. 
And with us, we have um, a preamble by Mr. Saramago and also Adolfo Pérez Escabel, who is a, a Nobel, Nobel Prize for Peace. And there is a series of dialogues and reflections you find on the book, which is very interesting about the Colombian context and the timing that uh, is framed in the book, but also we see how we find this peace developing process, but it is a very complicated situation as it happens with the elections, elections that will take place in Colombia. And that would be on the 25th of this month. And within Abenabe, you know her, she's been with us before. I would like to add some context. To give her opinion on her experience. I don't want to bore you down because I'm back here, but I'm also a member of the International Committee of the Lawyer Association. Uh, we call him Kaha. And it was created last year on the 35th anniversary. And I just have to say that it is an honor. It is an organization where we see that they try to disseminate hard work, hard work that sometimes go down, goes down the sink, but it's been hard work in Colombia. I think they are great uh, alternatives. They're, they've been the gut parents of the steps and measures taken for transition, democratic transition. And so this is a struggle on the foundation coming from the murders and deaths and threats because they are under a lot of pressure and a lot of threats. And well, they've struggled at all levels and they know what a wide-based or a broad-based strategy means. And they try to support victims in all possible manner. And it is important for the Inter-American Court for Human Rights as a supranational court fighting against him historical slaughters and massacres and decisions. They are trying to promote peacekeeping. And also, it's been ratified by the International Criminal Court in a way that hadn't even been heard of in Colombia before that. Then extraditions, 2008, uh, 2007. And that was President Revy with, uh, with the US. And we see also people from the AUC. And as you know, the US supported initiatives that I'm happy to lead in the US against some of the people who were extradited. And then we see a legal framework for peace and uh, together with the FARC guerrilla groups. And we hope this will ease the pace, the, the pace, the pace sorry, into this fight towards uh, transitional justice. Thank you, Almudena. You, could, you, you, you learned how to use the microphone this time around, right? Mr. Oye, who was with us earlier today, um, no need for introduction. Here, where we are seated, our offices in Madrid, it is quite easy to promote human rights. There's no problem there. Well, every now and then you get a letter or an email or you get a question as earlier today, but that's the risk we we take, not more than that. And so at promoting human rights in Spain, it's, it's, it's simple. But I've always been impressed by, the, by all these people, especially Miguel, who's one of the role models for those who are working in human rights because they're risking their lives every day in a terrible landscape. The minute they, they leave their doorstep to go to work early in the morning, they don't know what the day will, will have for them if, if they're going back home. It is uh, terrible that he had to seek asylum in Belgium and that 
because of the situation of human rights in Colombia that he has to walk around Bogota, but he cannot walk around. He needs to have an armored car. And, well, it is sad how human rights are not made real. And we see how there are over 200 people and the Santos government, and the Santos government's over 20, 220 people who've been killed for promoting human rights, 96 unionists. It is impossible for them to have a regular professional conversation because a tap, a tapping of telephones is just common. And as Valtrasat said, it is t the FARC guerrillas are now also in conversations. And while we see what their experiences are, and I'm a lawyer, I'm a colleague of all of them, and the only thing I can do, though, is reiterate our admiration and support and solidarity for all those processes and encourage you to keep, not to give up, because this is a claim for the whole European society. Thank you. Mm, uh, Wolfgang, you have as much time as you need. As a token of solidarity, we created the International Committee at Caja. It was last year. I'm happy to be one of the members. And I love it because it also entails a change in the terms of cooperation, north-south cooperation in the fight against human rights violations. Fifteen years ago in Madrid, Berlin, Paris, we were hoping for universal jurisdiction as the only way out. And now, Colombian people, Mexican people, people in India, in the Philippines, they are accompanying us and, and they've made so much progress. And now we are looking into a situation and, and we're talking to them, discussing what to do. Maybe it could be reason for litigation or on uh, the basis of uh, universal jurisdiction. Maybe prosecution should be carried out in, or taken in, in uh, the given country or maybe we resort to the International Criminal Court. It's not what we had 15 years ago, though. And this CAJAR is a model because we see impunity in case of crimes against humanity in the past, for example, in the 90s and before that and after that. But also it shows how we, now we are trying to fight the impacts of the new economic order because we have transnational companies that are using their leveraging on favorable conditions. And so in that regard, we are producing, we are finding new ways to fight those transnational companies, such as Nestle or others. Because we're trying to fight the attitude of large mining companies, which now wanted to use open possibilities in a bit more democratic Colombia than a decade ago, but less less prone to violations of human rights than a decade ago, but it's still very, very dangerous to their to its own citizens. And that's how we can learn a lot from them. Thank you very much, Wolfen, Wolfgang. Jimena Reyes, who is the head in America, of the International Federation on Human Rights. Working with another group of lawyers, Jose Alvarez Restrepo firm. Thank you very much. You might wonder why are there no cases on universal jurisdiction for Colombia? Well, it might be that the ICC for 10 years has had an interim examination of Colombia, and in their last report, well, it is said that in Colombia, international crimes are committed and have been committed. And the paramilitary groups, the guerrilla groups, and the state, they've all committed such crimes. 
And in that landscape, that scenario, where we find ongoing war with serious crimes and violations, but under a facade of uh, democracy, there are some civil society organizations which dynamically struggle to have rights protected. And the group of lawyers that is part of this is one of the leading organizations. And as Manuel said, they risk their own lives on a daily basis just to get an improved situation in Colombia, which I think is a good example of the problems of the whole continent. And a group, by the way, which is also exemplary and shows how these local victim and lawyer organizations that Almudena mentioned work because they are the front examples, the frontline examples on the struggle for human rights, as we see in the ICC or the Inter-American Court. And so, once again, I would like to reiterate our tribute, our tribute to these groups, to these organizations, and that's what you see on, on, on the documentary, the way they work. You see how they are organized, because that's the final target. The methodology, the target, well, is based on three key elements, improving situation in Colombia and in the continent, and it starts by focusing on fighting impunity in case of international crimes that are committed everywhere. Then, secondly, we need to claim and fight against the polarization of the society, which is a problem that's been covered by the media as part of the peacekeeping process. Because we, we will see that in the elections, and we'll see that with the presence of left-wing parties. And the third axis, third element that we are working on, or at least for the 10 years that I've been working with them, and it's been a source of, of learning for me, and that is being respectful to victims and how we need to focus on the empowerment of all the victims and hence I would really like to invite you to watch this very interesting documentary on some of the most representative cases cases about justice in Colombia. Thank you very much, Jimena. Luis Guillermo Pérez Casas, well, if we were to d define him, profile him, we would say that he's coherent, he's robust, he's sound, he's committed, invested. He's now leading this group, Jose Abel Restrepo Lawyers Group, as president and as representative before the American um, organi uh, state uh, organization. He's been working for 26 years now. And as the author of the book said, many of those years he had to spend them away in exile because of his investment, his commitment. Nowadays, most of his family is in Belgium, and for a long time, he led as Secretary General, as I say, he led the Federation on Human Rights, International Federation on Human Rights. I cannot be unbiased, because he's always been on the forefront, he's always been next to me, and fighting or struggling for what we all struggle at the foundation and, and personally, that's how I felt it. 
when all those proceedings were started in Spain, without a single doubt, he was part of the defense and helping out. Then we shared so many moments. When I was a prosecutor for the International Court, he said, we need to make an extra effort for Luis Moreno Campo to, to, for him to understand the need to have this investigation after the coup that had against Zelaya. And so we see how serious crimes have been committed and are still committed against those who promote human rights, against unionists, against farmers. And so when we managed to have that interim investigation started, we saw how things worked. And just by a notice of a visit from the international prosecutor to Honduras, we saw the immediate effect that it had. He is the advocate for Piedra Cordova. At this point in time, it is no longer in government, in the Colombian government. Piedra Cordova, he's been dismissed or he's been out. He's been put out of his uh, of power because he was accused of collaborating with the FARC. Those of you who know Piedad Cordova, you can see that she has always fight for peace. She has been a really hard fighter and worker. Well, now there is a peace process, a peace process aimed at terminating and putting an end to the armed conflict. And she has been strongly supporting that process for many years. Well, this is one of the many contradictions that I found in Colombia. We have shared many things together and many events for advocates of human rights. Guillermo Perez Casas, four years ago, as I can't remember, we were in Brussels, we were having a beer, and he said, I'm going back to Colombia, I must go back to Colombia, I have to go back to work and then to stand side by side uh, with my colleagues because I have to be there, I have to support them. And uh, he did that. He lost the tranquility and peace of mind of security enjoyed here in Europe. And he went there, he went there and uh, to stay in the first line, front line. So it is an honor to have you here and well, to share uh, what you have to tell us. And well, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Baltasar, and uh, to each and everyone here. Thank you for your kind presentation, for your warm presentation. We are deeply thankful to everyone in here and then also to very, well, to the people at this conference, they have shared, they have shown their solidarity, and they have supported our cause, and they have given us the support and that we needed to move forward to, with our, well, the advocacy that we do. Thank you so much to Maria Garzon for everyone that has contributed to making this conference a reality. Thank you for having invited me. I would like to start by taking as a basis what is reflected in our bylaws. So when you, when you start working on a case of human rights, human rights case, well, the first thing that you are asked is uh, how aware or how you feel about this uh, case or this. And it is clear that that person should have deep and clear respect for the victim and should 
script. And it is also written in the bylaws that that person should practice uh, love and feel love and feel commitment. And actually, to stay for 35 years now in an organization that has been uh, chased, that has been prosecuted, you really need, you do need lots of mutual trust. And well, despite the infiltrations that we suffered or that we had on the part of the government, actually, they actually wanted to create internal conflicts, internal um, clashes between ourselves. The, issued orders so that our passports were stolen from us before we left the country, so that we were denied visas to attend conferences and meetings regarding human rights, also instructions to burn the printing uh, prints where our publications were being printed. That is to say, to create an ongoing threat. Some of our colleagues uh, had their received threats to kill their daughters. They were single mothers. So fortunately, we managed to prove before the courts that all that had been instigated from the state. And then the court accepted the crime of psychological torture. So actually, when you live between the line of life and dead, death, well, your spirit changes. You are different. You live uh, by the minute. You live your day-to-day -day life with lots of intensity. So time is so valuable for us. So we live life with so much love, with so much intensity. We just don't have the time to get depressed. Or So it is, uh, in that sense, it is a wonderful experience. Well, of course, we have to coexist with fear. And then, yes, we know that when we leave home, we don't know whether we will come back home in the evening or not. However, we are strongly sure and we know, we know that all the work that we do is really helpful. And we see the fruits of it many times. We have had many, many achievements in terms of human rights. As so we have set up uh, commissions, organizations. We have given training to law experts we have also contributed to the development of the American uh, development of human rights. And we would have never thought about uh, making a film or writing a book about our work. We never, we never crossed our minds. But it was Antonio who took the initiative. He visited Colombia. He went there, and he had uh, his own resources. And he told us that he wanted to make a film and then to, to write a book about us. I'd like to finish by saying that at this point in time, there is possibility for a peace process in Colombia. We know that this is a strategic support of President Santos to consolidate the peace process. There are more than 6 million victims from the internal armed conflict, more than 7 million Colombian people that have fled, left the country for several reasons, finding the seeking for a better future. I found Colombian people in the most remote places in the world. So we need peace. We need to put an end to terminate this uh, situation. Our proposal is reconciliation special a special uh, tribunal for justice 
to ensure that the rights of the victims are respected within the transitional justice. However, well, the army believes that what we do, what we do is not legitimate. They tell us that we are a military target. General Ustategui, that was the first general sentence in Colombia for a case that we reported. They told us that we were a monster, a very powerful monster. And I said, well, the power that we have is the power that you confer us, that you give to us. Another DAS agent that disclosed the, uh, this exam scandal, Mr. Garcia, he confessed that he has served the paramilitary and he was sentenced to 25 years of prison after killing a, a, a lawyer. And then this man, when he was in prison, when he was talking to another prisoner, he said, look, this thing about a group of lawyers, it's a very complicated. So I'd rather be uh, chased or prosecuted by the CIAs than by this group of lawyers. And there is a recording for that conversation. But very many people love us the same as we love them. So we believe that what it is important in our fight for human rights, first of all, is to be sure that what we do is helpful, that the risk that we run is uh, worthwhile. And then second, we want to be very professional and then well, to take uh, steps and uh, steps and then to have many, many, many drops that will help us crack those rocks. Thank you so much. I would like to extend the invitation to watch the film on the 17th of June. Oh, well, no, we, we invite you to watch the film and to buy the book before the 17th of June. All right, so thank you. And